today. Um, Marilyn is a highly sought organizational consultant. Um, she goes way beyond the tips for getting organized in this book um, of most guys on the subject. She identifies the mindset, myths, rationalizations, and behaviors that perpetrate the cycle of chaos, clutter, and disorganization that can wreck can you havoc. Speak up a bit? Sure. Yeah. Her book provides the information for lasting change. Drawing on her own chronically disorganized past experience, she offers credible and compassionate ideas, advice, and examples. This is her creed, which, she has, which has changed her own life and allowed her to become a thought leader and innovator in this field. And uh, I just want to mention before um, I hand over to um, Marilyn, that we have coming up next week, um, Elliot Lillian, who's going to be speaking about his very popular book, you've probably heard about by now, Water is Rising in the Classroom, it's stories of teachers, nightmares that teachers have had. Um, and you'll have to come early if you want to get a good seat for that, I can guarantee that. Um, and then the week after that we've got Polly Jenkins Mann, and she'll be speaking about the Da Vinci Code Uncovered. Um, so. Now, if you want to um, buy a book and get it signed by Marilyn, um, we have some copies here and we have some more copies elsewhere. Um, so I think that's all I need to say for now. And Marilyn's going to talk a little bit about the book and then open it up to questions. So thanks again for coming and welcome Marilyn. Thank you. So I'll stand and um, I hope you can hear me. I'm just going to start with the first paragraph of the book, and then I will tell you a little bit about why this book, why I wrote it. And I'm going to give you a time management tip right off, which is what I often suggest to people as they enter into an activity, <laughs> is to just reflect for a few seconds even on what is it that you would like to have happen here for yourself? What did you come for? What are you listening for? And to focus your mind for what you want. In any activity that we're doing, everything from sitting in a meeting, to cooking a meal, to driving a certain place, we can keep referring back to what is it that we want out of that activity. Now, there are many times when we actually don't want to be there. So that's it's very handy to discover early on that you're in the wrong place and to leave. Now, it may lead to a mass exodus right now, but it's still valuable. So first paragraph of my book, which I have to say, I wrote this paragraph and sent it to Penguin Books, who's my publisher, I wrote it without actually thinking that other people were going to read this. <laughs> so this is how my book starts. My desk was piled high with papers, empty coffee cups, and unopened mail. Perhaps there was even an outdated check lurking in there somewhere. I couldn't tell. The floor served as my filing cabinet. I didn't put papers into files because I was afraid I wouldn't find them again. Now, I still couldn't find them easily, but at least I thought I knew their general whereabouts. So when I wrote this, little did I realize that I just wasn't thinking. Many, many people were going to read this paragraph and know this about me. But it, it gets much worse. It's not just that I had a pile of papers on my desk or I didn't cash checks for years. <laughs> But one year, I took my tax return. I f filled it out, and because I was afraid that I owed money, I put it in a drawer and lost track of it and didn't actually pay my tax bill for another year or so. And I would stay up worrying about it. So I'd think, I don't know, how much do I owe? Is it a thousand? But it's late now. How much, how much do they add to your bill? Do you think it's 50000 now? Do you think I owe 50000 to the IRS? <laughs> and I would frighten myself. <laughs> and when I did pay it, it was about $1,200. I thought, 
wow, that's so much better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but not only that, I, I was afraid to open my mail. And I put it, when I picked it up, I put it in um, on the counter. Then when the counter overflowed, I put it into bags. And then when the bags filled up, I put them into a closet. <laughs> and why, every once in a while, I'd think, ah, I need to open my mail. And then I'd take a bag out of the closet. I'd be so intimidated that I'd put it back in the closet. And that was that for a while. So I wrote this book because I desperately needed help. I needed help with not just the mail, but the dishes in the sink. Now, I have an MBA and a PhD from Yale University, so I'm a well-educated human being. But behind, and I could manage often to show up close to on time. But what was behind showing up close to on time, or maybe five minutes late or 10 minutes late, was a frantic rush. Maybe trying, if I was wearing makeup that day, to put it on in the car or whatever I was doing. So my life was quite chaotic. Now, there are great benefits to this. <laughs> Some of you may even have a chaotic life, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> Part of the benefit is your adrenaline is pumping a lot, and life feels like, ah, you know, something's happening. Now, even if the something that's happening is that I was running late, it had the feeling of a dramatic life experience. And as I learned to get more organized, and I'll tell you a little bit about that and then do a, a little bit more reading. As I learned to get more organized, something surprising happened that I actually didn't like at first. As I got more organized, I would show up on time or even a little early. Now, what do you do if you show up a little early? You could read, you could relax a little bit. Go shopping. <laughs> you could make a phone call nowadays with cell phones, but if you're early, what that means is the tension reduces, the anxiety reduces a little bit. If you can find something that you're looking for quickly, it means that moment of, oh, wait, I just put it here. Wait, wait, okay, where is it? I've got to leave and I've got to find my timer. <laughs> um, that starts to reduce. And let's say you're getting dressed to leave in the morning and your clothes are actually hung up in the closet. It means that instead of digging for your clothes, and pulling up the thing that you want to wear and saying, oh, it's wrinkled, I can't believe it, but I want to wear it, so I'll have to iron it. And now, you know, your things start to calm down. And at first, I thought, I'm bored. This is, this is, things aren't so interesting. And what I realized is, I'm calm. Calm and boredom are actually quite different. When you're when your mind relaxes a little bit, you start to see other things other than the frenzy and the chaos that's right in front of you. So that is one incredible benefit of getting organized. I see getting organized as a journey. For someone like myself who has, I have ADD, actually went to see Dr. Edward Hallowell, who wrote Driven to Distraction, and confirmed it. I do have ADD. I love to leave things open to the last minute. I don't like to pin plans down. I think of myself as a creative, imaginative person. But what, what I realized after a while is my disorganization was keeping me from being creative. I had a hundred projects that I'd started and I had a dissertation that I never did anything with because I can distinguish now between a creative mess, we're not gonna get rid of all the messes, there's a creative, um, potent, fertile mess 
that can happen in our lives. But there's also a toxic, deadening, sterile, uninteresting mess. When you try so hard to get organized every weekend and nothing happens, it's, it's stagnant, it's frozen. And that was my mess. And I had lost track of that wonderful spontaneity because I love spontaneity. But you can't really be spontaneous if you can't find your keys. You can't be spontaneous if you've got so many projects going on that you don't even know where to start. So it also affect, affected my love life. So I'm going to read a paragraph about myself and my husband. So before I started getting organized, I was single, I got organized, and I found my husband actually one, under one of the piles. <laughs> I, since he was there, I married him. Now, my husband is a neater type of person, also creative in his own way, but definitely neater. So there's a chapter called, Your Home Could Be Your Castle. In this chapter, we explore how to organize the home that you share with others. You'll deepen your understanding of how to share the common space, which could be your retreat, your sanctuary, a place where you renew your soul. When we live alone, we have only ourselves to argue with about keeping house. When we live with others, organizing often becomes a minefield. One person's cozy, homey retreat is another person's eyesore. I remember one day early in my marriage, soon after we returned from our honeymoon. After spending a few hours straightening up, I looked around and I thought our apartment looked terrific. I expected my new husband to say something appreciative when he came home, but he said nothing. <laughs> Honey, don't you notice anything special about the apartment, I inquired. He looked around and said, no, should I? And I said, well, I straightened up and I put everything away. He said, you did? <laughs> it still looks messy to me. When I looked around again, I saw all the little piles of newspapers, books, and magazines stacked neatly in the corners and on the coffee table. There were no piles on the rug, or on the couch, <laughs> or on any of the chairs. So I thought the place looked great. For him, the place would look great with no piles. No piles at all? Well, I had to consider that one. So that was a new concept for me, to actually get all the clutter out, put it away, get rid of it. That was a journey of years. And I actually, for many years, loved the feeling of my piles around me. And I have started to enjoy wide open spaces. But one thing that happens when you start giving up your piles, space opens up. That sense of burden starts to go away. And I wasn't used to living life without a feeling that oh, I just gotta get I just gotta do something with this pile. Just gotta do something with this pile. I wasn't used to the feeling of well my I had must have had 17 feet sort of displayed around my apartment. I wasn't used to the feeling of things being put away. So you can look this is a learning journey. There's some key helpful things. Getting organized is not just about putting things back. It's also about having systems that work for you, simple routines that you engage in easily and somewhat effortlessly. And it's also about creating daily habits. Now, on principle, I was against routines and habits. It seemed that that was a good way to ruin your life. <laughs> And what I've learned is a balance is helpful. So that if my habit was to just come in, I'll just demonstrate for a minute, just come in and 
just sort of drop my coat on the floor. One nice thing about that is it's quick. <laughs> and but you have to imagine if this was any kind any piece of clothing, it's quick and then you can go on to the next thing. The only thing is if you do that with all your clothes every day, it starts to create piles. So the key was what I did no, same with the dishes. Now I call that the drop method. The drop <laughs> method is uh, you're done with your meal and you leave your dish either on the table or just put it in the sink because you're done and you drop it in the sink. And same with email. You read an email, you drop it in your inbox. And the wonderful thing about the drop method, it is so quick. <laughs> the horrible thing about the drop method is it creates repercussions later that as you keep using the drop method you make it less and less likely that you will ever want to pick up at all <laughs> and when I started learning to put my clothes back or do my dishes at first it was onerous I actually thought you know I'd pick something up off the floor and feel like it'd take five <laughs> minutes and I'd put it on the hanger and then I'd go to the closet, and then there's no room, and I put it back on the floor. So that's when I learned I also had to empty out my closet. But there were all those clothes for when I was a size 4. But then I kept the ones from when I was a size 10. I, I surely will be able to wear size 10 again. So my closet was full of unwearable clothing. What does it take for us to actually let go? When we're taught to hang on, when we're taught to acquire, when everything about, so much of what we're about in a capitalist society is acquisition and hanging on. But what we don't often realize is if we keep letting go, new things happen there's space for something else and that's the core nature of our life if we can really let go something else really does happen and that's how come I was so surprised to find my husband under one of those piles <laughs> something else happened when I started to free myself up so I'm going to re read one more piece and then open this up for questions so I end the book, and there, there's a lot about what kind of life do we want to create. There's a lot of tips. I carry a timer. I don't have a basic sense of time, and I know some people think, wow, that's a pretty compulsive thing to do to carry a timer. But I could get come here, for example, into this bookstore and say, Marilyn, you have 10 minutes. And I'd say, yes, I have 10 minutes. And we, we have a six-month-old, and my, my, in, my parents live not far from here. So I could say, leaving my baby with my dad and my stepmother, and I'm going to do some errands. And it could take me hour. I could just, oh, books, <laughs> clothes, Concord Center. It's a great place to shop. Hours could go by. But I would lose that wonderful, valuable, most appreciated thing of having some place to leave my baby. So when we lose track of time, often we're forfeiting relationships. So I have to carry a timer because that's my nature. I'm not very good with time. So I'm going to end with a story from the Sufi tradition goes like this. There's a famous Sufi story about Mullah Nasruddin, who is a combination of fool and wise man. Several people come upon Nasruddin and are surprised to see him outside of his house, on his hands and knees, searching the ground under a lamppost. What are you doing? They asked. I'm looking for my keys, he answered. So they got down on their hands and knees and started looking as well. After a little time went by and they had no success, one thought to ask him, where did you lose your keys? 
Inside my house, Nasruddin answered. Then why are you looking out here on the street? They asked, because there's more light out here. <laughs> At first, we tend to think that Nasruddin is just being ridiculous. How silly, we would never do anything so absurd. But upon reflection, perhaps we are much like him. We look for lost items where there's plenty of light, where we can see. However, it's hard to find your keys when you're looking in the wrong place. One way of thinking about the story is that when we lose a precious item, we tend to look in the obvious places outside of ourselves. Perhaps we first need to investigate the darker places inside ourselves in order to find what we're looking for. If the keys are on the inside, we can look outside all we want and never find them. Another completely different way of thinking about the story is that Nasruddin wasn't really looking for his keys at all. Rather, he just wanted help with his search. So he looked outside in the light where people could see him. And as his neighbors joined him in searching the street, he got exactly what he wanted, companionship. So one reason I wrote this book and exposed, and there's a lot more about my disorganization, exposed how chaotic my life was in a world where I certainly went to Yale to get a PhD so I could perform well and look good and be accomplished and be seen as accomplished, is that very often we can't tell other people what our lives are really like. We can't really tell people that we're scrambling for much of the time. So not everyone is close to as disorganized as I was. But some of us, and many people I, I understand, have benefited from what I've learned on the journey, which is that it is an inner quest and an outer quest. So there's some great, great and important organizing tips. It's very helpful to have a place for everything and to put things back when you're done with them. It's extremely useful. It's very helpful once a quarter or so to just purge your closet and let go of things you didn't wear in the last year. It's very helpful to start any meeting, anything that you're doing with a sense of focus and what do I want here. It's very <coughs> helpful to, instead of when someone makes a request of you, instead of saying, sure, I'll do that, say, let me think about that for a moment. Do I really have time? So some those four things are some of the best organizing tips I know. But it's hard to use the tips if we don't have a good understanding of, wait a second, this way of life means something to us. It's benefiting us in some ways. It may be valuable to us and it's costing us a lot. And so I encourage people to talk about what their lives are really like. So I think the path of organizing is about finding the keys inside ourselves and the companionship to make the search easier. If there's one thing you gain from reading this book, I hope it is that you can find help and fellowship in cleaning up. You may have to reveal to others that you are on the path of organizing. Risky, perhaps, but worth it. Some of us have the feeling that we are always looking for something, usually alone. Now, perhaps, we can look together. And the journey does not have to be so lonely because being disorganized can lead to a lot of loneliness. So that's um, a bit of my talk and a bit of a reading, and I'm happy to take questions, and then if, you're, if you would like to sign, sign some books. <laughs> I'd like to ask, you know, it's in, in any couple, there's generally one was more organized than the other. And um, yes, I hear that that's what 
God, who is a great matchmaker, actually does that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> well, in my relationship, it's my husband. And so I'm curious to know. It's your husband it's, what? It, my husband is not very organized. Oh, he's not. And he leaves the trails around the house. Yeah, okay. you know? But um, in your experience, what 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 precipitated the move towards being organized? Was For it me? Was it your marriage? No, no. I, I actually wasn't married. I didn't even know my husband at the time. I was working with a colleague who um, was able to tell me how much havoc I was wreaking in our working life. And he essentially, without anger or rancor, but essentially sat me down one day and said, Marilyn, I can't work with you anymore. Which it was, this is a beloved colleague and work that I love to do. And he was able to tell me in such a way that I grasped that my skidding into deadlines, not doing things in a certain way, I grasped that even though I valued him and didn't want to make life harder for him, I really was. And so that was a very, that was a turning point for me. I knew I was disorganized, but I sort of thought, you know, it's the way I am, you know, I'm a wonderful person, you have to take it off. And I was doing harm. I was doing harm. And I didn't want to. So that was hard. Yes? Any tips for letting go of things like that you don't use a lot, like papers or clothes or kitchen items or, you know, the mentality of, oh, I might need it tomorrow type of thing? Yes, I do. I talk a lot about that, actually, in the book. And one thing I talk about is um, <clears throat> what we usually, so I talk about the chatter. One Here's, here's sort of the very brief outline of what I say to people. First of all, I think it's important to have, one, a good understanding of what all the excess stuff is costing you. It's costing us our lives in many ways. In fact, Thoreau said the, the cost of a thing is all, I'm paraphrasing, but it's all the time it takes to move it, keep it, store it, dust it off, think about it, it's a huge cost. The next thing I think that helps is have a vision of how you want to be, the vision of spaciousness. Then when you go to that thing in the closet or that beautiful copper pan that you never use, and you say, well, you know, this is, I love this, it's beautiful, I want to use it, is rather than saying, I might use it someday, you say to yourself, this is costing me life energy. It's a different it is. It's costing life energy. And the more I can let go of, the more interesting my life will become. Now that's, you have to take that on faith. Because we're taught the more I can hang on to, the more possibilities I will have. That's how we think. We think the more stuff I hang on to, the more possibilities are. And I'm going to propose that the more stuff we let go of, the more life opens up. So that's, you open up space and energy. So that's a very short, and, and I have a whole section in here which I could read from. It's, it's a chapter <coughs> called, oh, things. We own them, they don't own us. And how do you really work through that? So that's the sort of short answer. Yes. What do you say to people who live alone? Well, I started all of this when I lived alone. And there was not just one of me, I think. There was at least, there was the messy one of me, and then there's the other one of me whom I was driving crazy. So when I lived alone, which is when all of this started, I dropped stuff on the floor. I didn't do my dishes on principle. My mother, God rest her soul, would tell me, a woman with a neat house has nothing better to do with her time. Now, she's a Bryn Mawr graduate, sort of like a Bryn Mawr thing, I think. But, um, so I believe that if I straightened up, it would indicate that I didn't have anything else to do. And here was something that was very powerful for me to learn. It doesn't save time to be disorganized. And it didn't actually make me more interesting to be messy. 
So those were two personal discoveries. My weekends had gotten pretty boring. I would say, okay, this is it. This weekend, this is it. I'm cleaning up. I'd get started, I'd start doing, you know, sorting. I can talk about sorting. It's, you know, okay, anything to do with the apartment and finances and um, articles I want to send to people, I'd sort it all out. And then I'd get really tired and hungry and have a blood sugar problem saying, you know, I've got to go eat. And then since I ate, I'd have to go exercise. <laughs> and so I'd say, well, I can't leave all this stuff out here, so I'll just... <laughs> pile it up and put it back <laughs> and I had the horrible feeling there was one Sunday I was doing this I thought I'm going to do this for the rest of my life every Sunday for the rest of my life I'm going to be <laughs> then, so that scared me so I, in terms of living alone I had, there was like a committee an inner committee I've been meditating for 35 years and I thought my meditation practice was going to help me clean up because I desperately wanted calm and order. So I had my meditating self, my messy self, my frenzied self, my yoga self, and we weren't living well together. Any other questions? Yes. <coughs> you spoke of your apartment with the piles that were hardly visible to you but were to your husband and you thought about the prospect of no power, putting the clutter away. What is putting away something? To me, yeah. what it means is first, do I have something here that's really of use? Do I use it? That's really the first question. Is this of value in my life as I am living it now? Not in my life from last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. That's the first question. Am I using it or do I love it? Is it beautiful? If the answer is no, like, you may have a question such as, you find insurance, auto insurance papers, contracts from, let's say, 1997. Do you keep them? That's a good organizing question. The answer is no. But if you don't know the answer, you keep them. So then you keep all this stuff. So one is, there's an information part. Do you keep it? No, you throw it out. Don't worry. It's OK. But it's also belongings, it's also what, so putting things away means, first of all, is this of value or of some value? It's of value then to find storage places that are accessible so that you really use it. I call it finding an alive place for everything. I started to believe that it's nice to have only stuff you use or think is beautiful around you. And Putting it away for paperwork, I can file now. I didn't know how to file. Filing is not about the alphabet. Filing is about retrieval in ways that make sense to you. And I am a big pile file filer in a sense. What you mainly need with files are like is with like. That's all you need. And if you have large categories, that's fine. You could have auto, the name of your children, um, money. Th that's fine. You, so instead of sorting through, like, you know, I know it's in here somewhere, you sort through a smaller. That works for me. You know, often we're taught to file by people who are fabulous filers, but then we can't find anything. It is, this month is National Getting Organized Month. <laughs> and if you, I want to mention that there is something called the National Association of Professional Organizers, and it is extremely helpful to get a professional organizer. I was, I did that, I got someone to help me. I don't have that gene or something. <laughs> What I needed to do, though, was prepare myself to be a little more organized, because I was so dedicated to being messy that the first time I had an organizer, she sort of helped me clear everything up, and it's all nice and neat, and I sort of put everything back. I, I made the mess again. Any other questions? 
Yes. Um, do you know anyone who's not in those courses? Because I know you have mentioned them in your book about getting organized support groups. Do I know anyone who's been in a yeah, support group? People actually just find those resources, or is it kind of blind in the blind sometimes? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Are, can a support group be of value? Because I mentioned support groups in the book. I'll just take mention that I'm giving a workshop. I have a few flyers here. If anyone is interested, a half-day session where you work through things and meet other people who can be helpful. I found it invaluable to create support. People whom I work with, I, I have occasionally run groups, so I think people, it's invaluable to get people to talk to, even a buddy, often you can see something in someone else that they can't see. They can see something in you, like um, simple things that you can help each other out with. We're, we're all disorganized in different ways. There's not like one way to be disorganized. So I am a big fan of getting support. Yes? Uh, two things. One, I just want to add to that that and help that I've gotten the importance of good chemistry and a feeling of fellowship with who you're working with because it could be so yes. intimidating to yes. someone will look at your life. But, to, but the, the skill of someone who really um, just yeah. makes you feel good and safe yes. and comfortable is huge. To yes. Me. To me, that's really important. Yes. And I want to reinforce that. <laughs> just say anyone whom you're trying to get help with should leave you feeling not ashamed and upset. Oh, okay, we have five more minutes. <laughs> well, I, the other half of my question was the impact of your baby, of having a baby in your life and how how your systems, that they continue to work and how's that going? I couldn't do this. I could not have this beautiful child if I were as crazy messy as I was before. Um, now, a baby is a baby. You know, I'm, there's sort of a stream of sort of, I'm trying to keep up with this wonderful human being. But at the end of the day, even when I'm exhausted, I now know I take a half an hour, and this is how I do my meditation now. At 8.30 or 9, before I collapse, I take time to restore order. I put the toys back and wash the bottles and I do things so that when I wake up in the morning I'm not overwhelmed by the mess and often we're so exhausted at the end of the day that we say the only thing we can do is watch TV it's like you're not ready to go to bed and you just don't feel like doing anything and it's sort of like let a show wash over you <laughs> and if you can in that moment remind yourself that if you can take that same half hour in a meditative stance and Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Buddhist monk, or John Kabat-Zinn wrote a beautiful book called Wherever You Go, There You Are. If you can take on a, mind, a mindset of mindfulness and gently put things back and return them to their place with gratitude that you have so much. We are all blessed. There's not one of us who's not blessed. There's not one of us here who's not suffered greatly, but there's not one of us here who also isn't blessed. And with that sense of blessing, to quietly restore order in ourselves, to restore order to our home, and then make a list of what you need to do tomorrow, Write it down so you don't wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, oh, what, what? And put yourself to bed. And as things calm down, things get more exciting. So I, um, we adopted our baby. We actually weren't looking to adopt an infant. We heard about this child on June 13th. He was born on July 1st, and it so happened that we were able to adopt him essentially on the spur of the moment. So that to me was one of the great benefits of having my life somewhat in order, is that we now have this time.
totally fabulous baby. So, and I think that's one of the great benefits of getting organized is that when something amazing, some amazing opportunity shows up, that you can take advantage of it. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you very, very much, and I'll stay here and sign books and answer a few more questions. I, if you're interested in, in the workshop, um, I have a few flyers here. If it runs out, it should be on my website, um, which is www.marilynpaul.com in a couple days. And um, thank you so very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.